and welcome to part one of my Canuxploitation a thon, spotlighting cult films from everyone's favorite, most boring country on earth, Canada. It's hard to believe that after more than 80 episodes of this show, I've only done one Canadian movie. Yeah. Anyway, it's about time I change that. Canada's actually produced a lot of cult films over the years, from classic stuff like Black Christmas, Heavy Metal, and Videodrome, to more recent stuff like Manborg and Wolf Cop. And in the proud tradition of this show, I am going to be spotlighting precisely none of those movies I just mentioned. Instead, we're going to dive deep into some truly forgotten cult movie territory here. In fact, the one I'm about to talk about hasn't ever been released on DVD. That's always a good sign, right? Blue Monkey is a 1987 monster movie that's mostly notable for its nonsensical title. Blue Monkey, huh? Weird, considering this VHS box has a giant bug on it. Although, according to this poster for the movie, it's about a killer case of earwax. The original title was actually Green Monkey, which also has nothing to do with the movie, so nice to know the filmmakers decided to troll people right from the very beginning. The movie's also known as Invasion of the Body Suckers and Insect. Alright, so those aren't exactly the most original titles ever, but they make a hell of a lot more sense than Blue Monkey. It's always a good sign when your copy of the movie begins with 25 seconds of a black screen. Even this VHS rip doesn't want to get to the movie. Blue Monkey, winner of most misleading title at the 1987 Canadian Film Awards. Anyway, we start on an old lady who looks like she probably sings to her plants. Now, who would like a little music? What's this? Maybe this old lady isn't as lonely as I thought. Special deal on repairs today, Marwella. If you'll have dinner with me on Friday. I accept your offer. About seven. Okay, maybe Blue Monkey is slang for the Viagra this guy's gonna need after their date. The plot gets kicked off when this guy pricks his finger on one of the old lady's plants. Oh, you should see a doctor right away. Ah, just a pin prick. Are you sure you're all right? Never felt better in my life. Okay, so he's definitely dead. Sure enough, the guy collapses and gets taken to the hospital. Hopefully nurse sexy librarian here can help him. One of my plants caused it. Plant? plant? You sure it wasn't a blue monkey? We then meet our main character, played by Steve Railsback, who's probably just glad he's not still on the set of Nuki. Steve plays Detective Bishop, whose partner's just been shot. He needs a goddamn doctor, not some piss in our end! You a doctor? Yes. You called for one, didn't you? All right, take it easy, lady. I'll provide the snark here, okay? Before they can help Steve's partner, though, the old man from the beginning takes a turn for the worse. Oh my god, did he just poop out of his mouth? That's one of the grossest things I've ever seen. And uh, get that man into isolation. Yeah, and get him some toilet paper so he can wipe his mouth. Worried that it might be contagious, the hospital decides to give everyone examinations, although I'm not sure why, since apparently Steve's partner getting shot is a bigger deal to them. It's not often that we get a gunshot victim at the county memorial, though they'll be talking about this day for a long time. Right, they're going to be talking about the guy who got shot, and not the guy who puked up an insect turd because he touched a flower. We learn the hospital used to be an insane asylum, which explains why it's still haunted by all the bugs caught in flypaper there. We also learn it's apparently a futuristic science lab where they're making a giant super laser. Yeah, bet your local hospital doesn't have that. We've just installed the Exxon laser. We'll be involved in molecular breakdown experiments for DNA and RN and... You know, like all rundown hospitals that used to be insane asylums. Also, if your intention is to use that for surgery, you probably shouldn't use a laser from the fucking Death Star. <laughs> we still have a few bugs to iron out. Alright, well, at least now we know what they're gonna use to kill the monster at the end. While these scientists are busy creating the lawnmower man, Railsback shows how good he is with children. Is that a real gun? You bet. Can I see it? Not right now, son. But ask me a little later and we can shoot some rats by the dumpster out back. Oh, and if you guess these kids are going to be in the rest of the movie, you'd be correct. That's right, even Canadian monster movies have Kennys. Anyway, how's the old man's turd baby doing? So this wine exterior is really just a shell. 
There's actually something else inside. I don't understand why the insides don't photograph. Uh, that thing is moving. You might want to keep an eye on that. And it wouldn't be a Canucksploitation movie without John Vernon playing a hard-assed authority figure. Judith, what the hell's going on here? We're not exactly sure, Roger. All right. When I still want this matter cleaned up as quickly and as quietly as possible. From now on, this outbreak is on double secret probation. But something tells me he's not taking this situation seriously. I think we should alert the LIDC. The LIDC? Lincoln Institute for Disease Control in New York. Well, don't you think we're overreacting? I mean, an old man develops a high fever from an insect bite. He just puked up a turd that is now moving and can't be x-rayed. How is this not a big deal? They eventually decide to cut the thing open, and congratulations, Doc, you just unleashed a plague. Get on the cover! seen an insect like that before. This could take attention away from that gunshot wound everyone's talking about. Speaking of gunshots, Steve still needs to let these kids use his firearm. Uh-oh. It's okay, kids. He's not really Charles Manson. And in case you thought this movie wasn't Canadian enough, here's two SCTV cast members. Joe Flaherty and Robin Duke play a couple expecting a baby. Hopefully they can add some humor to this movie. When did the labor pain start? Uh, they haven't yet. Then why did you come in? Uh, ask Mr. Database. Database. Yeah, nice try, but you're not fooling anybody. If this place was any more Canadian, the receptionist would be Wayne Gretzky. There's no need for sarcasm. Hey, don't tell me how to do my fucking job! And it doesn't look like your wife's actually in labor. You might want to take her home. Is he always like this? Should have seen him on our honeymoon. I didn't see that, but I bet I know what sound he makes when he comes. And you mean the old man is still alive? He just gave birth from his neck. How is he not dead yet? His bones are dissolving and flooding his circulatory system. I wish some of this made sense. Welcome to my world, lady. Oh! Clear! Okay, if anyone asks, he was like this when he came in, all right? We learn the infection from the old man is spreading to other people in the hospital, and if that wasn't bad enough, it looks like there's a slasher movie villain on the loose. <laughs> oh, Ted! Oh, never mind, it's just a fake scare. And sure, just leave the weird death bug unattended. They didn't consider it a big deal before, why start now? Meanwhile, in an establishing shot, the Institute for Disease Control learns about the infection. You're not gonna believe this, but four more patients have been stricken. All within 40 minutes of exposure. We need to initiate a class 4 there immediately. I can understand why these guys are concerned about it spreading. Especially since this hospital lets little kids just wander around wherever the fuck they want. Oh, and what are the odds that little kids are about to make a monster movie much worse? I wanna see this! Ah! Uh-oh. Now look at your dick, bullshit! Nice job, kids. But maybe this'll make the bug turn into a blue monkey and the title will make sense. Since someone at the hospital finally figured somebody should tell them what the bug is, they get a kooky entomologist to come take a look at it. It's a pretty color. <laughs> guess you'd have to order something like this far in advance, wouldn't you? You couldn't just go into a lot and get an orange one, I guess. I wanted to get a blue one once. That still doesn't explain the title. Ah, I was wondering when this movie was going to turn into a porn. What? That's what all the nurses on the VHS cover look like they're from. <laughs> Well, either they've been killed, or this guy has the dirtiest jizz I've ever seen. Whoa, sounds like somebody just saw a blue monkey! So the insect is now apparently giant-sized, and if you're wondering how it got that way... What is this? Nucleic acid clarifier. It's a genetic growth promoter. Wait, so this place has a super growth hormone that can make an insect giant-sized within minutes and a death laser? Is this hospital funded by Dr. Insano? And how is this place not rich off these inventions? The power goes out, probably to prepare us for what the rest of the movie looks like. I'm serious, parts of this movie rival the dark for how dimly lit they are. For all I know, there could be a blue monkey in this movie and I just couldn't see it. At least these ladies have the right idea. Time to get high off some cough syrup.
So with the infection spreading and a giant bug on the loose, Vernon has no choice but to put everyone in double secret isolation. But even that's not good enough for the government since they put the hospital under quarantine. This entire hospital is under complete quarantine. This is our authorization from the governor. Disease Control House! Meanwhile, a janitor finds the monster's lair in the industrial facility that's also apparently in this hospital, and sees that it's cocooning its victims, proving that this movie is nothing but a rip-off of Cocoon. That movie is where monsters cocoon people, right? Uh, I never actually saw that one. I see they're hiding the monster so far, but something tells me this movie's gonna be less Jaws and more Legend of the Dinosaurs. Things have gotten so bad, even the actors are desperately trying to escape this movie. And I think the government might be overreacting a little bit. We haven't seen so many guns. What do you think's going on? Something big. I want to find out. Kid, this is all your fault. You fed that monster the growth hormone, and now people are dead because of you. So how about you sit your ass down, and you stay in your goddamn room? Or just wander around the hospital some more. Maybe that means the monster will eat them next. Rails back, the entomologist and one of the doctors go looking for the monster. But is this going to be a stand-up fight or just another bug hunt? At least we know why. The power's out. What the hell could have done something like that? Do you think it could have been a blue monkey? Right now, Steve's really hoping the monster's as hot as Matilda May. Unfortunately for him, it isn't. You know, I'd like to comment on the effects, but the movie's so dimly lit I can't really see them. Thankfully, the entomologist is there to tell us more about it. Oh my god. It's getting the birth. The creature is a hermaphrodite, having both male and female sexual organs. That's right, everybody. This monster can literally go fuck itself. And note to self, being next to a giant killer insect is unwise. <laughs> Well, the monster's already trying to kill her, so the doc decides to cut out the middleman and go straight to the morgue. I don't know if she's safe, but at least the lighting's a little better in here. Hey, it's okay, come on. Oh. It moved off to the shadows. This whole movie is in shadows! They try and find the monsters again, only to learn they've entered the network of tunnels under the hospital, because why wouldn't this place have a giant maze under it? At least there's a chance these kids might get lost. I wonder if we'll find anything down here. I bet we're gonna find a big blue monkey. Title drop... for whatever that's worth. And come on, monster, the kids are right there! Start chasing them! Fun fact, this was the first movie ever to be lit completely by lava lamp. Time for our heroes to think of a plan to kill the monsters. We have to kill a female and destroy the eggs. What about the male? Oh, it's not that simple. That thing's out of shells like armor plating. So conventional weapons are useless against it. Try shooting it in the face with a tank. I'm pretty sure that'll work. They decide to lure the male away so they can torch the female and the eggs, and keep the male alive so they can use it to create a vaccine for the disease. And because Baldy says so, I guess. God, we got a killer loose, he wants to study it. You know, Steve Railsback is... actually not that bad in this movie. I mean, this definitely isn't one of his great performances or anything, but he doesn't seem to be sleepwalking through it. And he easily could, especially considering in the credits he's listed after the guy who plays the monster. Oh, and guess who they get to take them through the tunnels to find the monster's nest? Sure, I can take you down there, no problem. Thanks, kid. After that, are you gonna tell him that you're the one who fed it the growth hormone and caused all this? The kid agrees to take him through the tunnels, but how are the other patients doing? <laughs> You two are a fine pair. The whole hospital's going nuts and you managed to get yourself shit-faced. Eh, I think they got the right idea. But this makes the nurse realize how to cure the disease. Alcohol. Stop the toxins from spreading through your body. Yep, even the characters know alcohol's the only way to make it through this movie. Oh, and Robin Duke's giving birth now, so I guess that plotline's still a thing. Come on! This way, Detective Bishop. Wow, looks like this kid really knows these tunnels. He's just like Newt from Aliens. That is, if Newt was responsible for bringing the aliens and getting everybody killed. Yeah, I'm not letting that go. I don't care that this kid went on to be in Donnie Darko. 
Even though people are dead because of this kid, the movie just lets him off the hook. He doesn't tell anybody he fed the bug the growth hormone. He doesn't apologize and say he's sorry for all the trouble he caused. He just acts like everything's fine and then the movie expects us to root for him. It's okay, Joey. You did good. No, he didn't! After they get close to the monster, Railsback tells the kid to go back, but what a surprise, he doesn't listen. Look, movie, I know shooting in darkness can help hide flaws in the special effects, but does it have to hide everything else, too? Looks like they found the hive just in time to see it give birth to the alien from the hidden. If this plan doesn't work, they should try calling an exterminator and then feeding him the growth hormone. And thanks for the chase scene, movie. I always wondered what aliens would look like if the cameraman left the lens cap on. Oh look, this thing's impervious to conventional weapons, yet it can't get through a chain-link fence. Railsback manages to kill the female and the eggs, and the monster does not appreciate him killing about 500 of his kids. Must be Bishop. Yeah, and he better run if he doesn't want to end up like this Bishop. Demogorgon, what are you doing here? Oh look, now he has to carry the kid. Is there any situation this little shit can't make worse? Find your friends! Tell them... Tell them to run through the first floor and warn everybody to... Get in the rooms and lock the doors, you understand? Aw, oh, but I wanted to feed it more growth hormone so it could kill more people. The new plan is to lure the monster into the science lab, because come on, you didn't think they wouldn't use that super laser, did you? And instead of telling people to stay in their rooms, it looks like the kid told everybody to spill out into the hallway. <laughs> You know, I would use the decapitation clip there, but it was so dark, I'm not even really sure that's what happened. Right now, Steve wishes he had a really big can of Raid. Actually, why don't they tell the army guys there's a giant bug on the loose? They could probably help. Oh, yeah! It's coming! Hey, thanks for reminding me Robin Duke's still giving birth. I was wondering how that plot line was going. <laughs> Dude, the door was open! Things look bad, but I'm not worried. Steve Railsback survived starring in Nuki and making out with Patrick Stewart. I'm pretty sure he can handle this. They managed to lure the monster into the science lab, and they better hurry up and use that laser. Dennis Miller needs it to kill Angie Everhart. You know, now that I'm able to get a better look at this thing, the effects aren't the worst I've ever seen. Then again, considering most of the monsters on this show look like this, I probably have different standards than most people. They use the super laser on the monster, and it doesn't really seem to do much. It seems to have the same effect as annoying somebody with a laser pointer. Damn, if only this lab had a giant magnifying glass they could burn it with. The eyes! The eyes! The eyes? You're trying to kill it, not give it LASIK surgery. I guess shooting it in the eyes works, although I'm not sure if the monster's dying or if the director's just having fun with the monster costume. Okay, it's dead. Now they just need to pick it up with the tissue and flush it down the toilet to be sure. And so the plague is contained and the hospital is... huh? Oh, looks like Joe Flaherty and Robin Duke had their baby. I'm so glad they resolved that plotline. And as long as we're wrapping up plot threads, how's Steve's partner doing? Jim? Thanks. And that's the moment where Steve Railsback stopped giving a shit. And why won't these kids stay in their damn rooms? Will I ever see you again? What do you mean, will you ever see me again? You bet on it. I'm sending you to Juvie for causing all this. Hope you got a good lawyer, kid. Oh, and one of the kids is Sarah Polly. Just thought I'd leave that till the end to see how many comments I got. All in all, it looks like everything worked out okay. Or did it? <laughs> Yeah, this movie's about as likely to get a sequel as the 1998 Godzilla. I'm actually kind of surprised this movie's never gotten a DVD release. It definitely isn't great, but it's at least competent, which is more than I can say for some movies that have gotten DVD releases. Are you telling me Ape deserves to be on DVD and this doesn't? The only mention it seems to have gotten since it was released is a throwaway line in a Mystery Science Theater 3000 special. You know what you need? You need movies like, oh, Mighty Joe Young, King Kong, The Blue Monkey. 
Okay, I guess nobody told him there isn't a monkey in that movie either. Well, that's the end of part one, but there's a lot more where that came from. So tune in next time if you truly want to see the depths Canadian filmmakers were willing to go to. Until next time... What are you in for? Leukemia. Hello and welcome to part two of my Canucksploitation-a-thon. I got a 1980s slasher movie for you this time, and unlike the last movie I did, this one's actually available on DVD. The Carpenter is a 1988 horror movie that shows you what would happen if you put Ghost, Black Christmas, and reruns of This Old House into a blender. You know it's gonna be good because it's brought to us not just by gems, but gold gems. So, how does this movie get our attention? Uh, is there such a thing as power tool porn? Cause it feels like that's what I'm watching right now. See, look, there's even a sawdust money shot. All in all, this Jesus biopic is off to a very weird start. Alright, alright, I'm sure it'll pick up after the credits. Well, there's a switch. The movie got bored before I did. Oh, never mind. It's decided to do some arts and crafts. This is our protagonist, Alice. And when her husband comes home and sees what she's done, he... puts her in the hospital? For cutting up one of his suits? Okay, seems like something a good talk could have solved, but whatever. Oh, Mr. Jared, it's almost I noon. Fine. I'm going. I gotta go shop for more suits. Okay, I'm assuming all the dissolves mean that some time has passed and she can leave now, but best to be sure. I'm free. You're free. You're free, Alice. You're free, Alice. So I take it she's free then? And it turns out she's not in the hospital, she's in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, one of the downsides to having free healthcare, getting your appendix out is a bitch. Well, there's no point in being inactive. Okay, I guess that was just a dream sequence, although it's kind of hard to tell in this hospital. For example, what the hell is happening with this lady in the back? Oh, and having marital problems with the wife? Just buy her a new house. That way she can have her own closet full of suits she can cut up. Don't worry. Oh yeah, here's something you might notice about this movie. There are a ton of dissolves in it. This would be okay if they just used them to show the passage of time, but a lot of times the movie does them for no reason. Like here, she's just walking towards the house. Why is this edited like a montage? And this is immediately followed by another sequence with even more dissolves. Did the doctor really kill her earlier and these are her dying thoughts? The house still needs some work, so Alice's husband hires the mullet brigade here to fix it up. You're an idiot. Okay, so I'm an idiot. Yeah, I think he had the same conversation with his barber when he asked for that haircut. Foreman Gary Busey Ed Bagley Jr. here tells him to get back to work before it gets dark, but oh, too late. Maybe Alice will sleep better now that she's out of the hospital. Jeez, I've heard of sawing logs when you sleep, but this is ridiculous. Oh, never mind. It's just someone working on your house in the middle of the night. I'm sure he's normal. Do you have any idea what time it is? Well, job ain't done till it's done, huh? <laughs> oh, it's a nail gun. Oh, well, now I'm not shitting my pants. Wingshauser plays the carpenter of the title, and given his filmography, I'm surprised it took me this long to get to one of his movies. Looks like it's time for our meet cute. Look, this, this work, do you have to do it now? Well, it ain't done, and it's, uh, yeah, it's gotta be done. Okay. I'm sorry. This guy woke you up in the middle of the night and is technically trespassing on your property, and you're the one saying sorry. This movie really is Canadian. Alright, time to unpack her husband's suit so she can cut him up again. And what's this? The carpenter isn't in the basement anymore? That must mean he's a g g g g ghost Or something even worse. Look, basement walls don't dress themselves, alright? Well, then who did him? It's Scabs. Scabs for sure. Well, that just feathers my mullet. 
We learn Alice's husband is having an affair with one of his students. I guess she must have a thing for guys who look like Phil Silvers. And this is the closest we'll get to any nudity in this movie, so drink it in, people. But it turns out Alice has a secret admirer, too. Yeah. Guys, you want to talk about class, let's talk about that Gerald woman, okay? It just so happens I'm supposed to go see her tonight. I don't know, I'm feeling... Feeling kind of sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. This guy's idea of a romantic evening is five cent wings in a Dawkin concert. Hello, I'm here to be the movie's first victim. Can I come in? Something tells me Alice isn't gonna go for this guy's rugged Joey butafuco esque good looks. You know, Mrs. Jared, I love wine. Don't know too much about it, though, you know? <laughs> yeah, this guy probably considers Molson a wine. But I know what the hell I like. Are you talking about sexual assault? Because that's what it looks like. But there's one thing greater than this guy's love of rape, and that's his hatred of scabs. So it's goddamn fucking scab students. Hey, don't hate on scabs. They help stop you from bleeding. Which is something you're gonna need in a second. <laughs> You know, he's taking this remarkably well. He's not screaming or anything. Look, you stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Okay, guess I'll just go to bed. Have fun murdering that guy. Oh, and sorry you tried to rape me earlier. It's bad enough the carpenter murdered someone, but he didn't even bother to clean up properly. I think this house needs a total cleaning. Well, hopefully this place comes with a ghost maid you can use. We get some more dissolves, but at least they're in an actual montage this time. Not satisfied with her home life, Alice applies for a job at a paint shop run by a character from a Tim Burton movie. Any retail experience at all? No, but I'm very good with people. I'm very agreeable. You could murder somebody right in front of me and I just act like nothing happened. What about health problems? Well, I recently recovered from a nervous breakdown that had me in the hospital for several weeks, and sometimes I see things that can't really be happening, but I know that, so I don't think it's really anything that'll interfere with my job. And you're hired. Is there a sequel to this movie called The Painter? Because I find it hard to believe that this guy doesn't have bodies in his crawl space. And who the hell is this? Mr. Mort, I'd like you to meet my sister, Rachel. Your sister? Well, hello, hello. How do you do? Didn't know you had a sister. Yeah, neither did I. You probably should have introduced her a little earlier. One perk of Alice's new job, she gets all the free paint she wants. And damn it, movie, she's painting the same spot. You don't need to dissolve there. At least the carpenter's working outside now. Murder is one thing, but you do not want to keep people up at night. That's just rude. Time for Alice to continue her budding romance with a killer ghost carpenter. I've got a job too now. Well, that's fine. I mean, that's real fine. Yeah, I understand that these days that's a uh, lady's privilege. Oh, he kills people and he's okay with women in the workforce? This guy is a real catch. Looks like the carpenter's unfinished business consists of fixing up the house. So now I know what Casper would be like if he was played by Bob Vila. And damn ghost carpenters taking jobs away from hardworking living people. I'd like to talk to you two guys. Hey guys. Oh. Yes, a massa. Yes, and we's a coming. We's a coming. Damn it, Bill, this is no time for your Jar Jar Binks impression. These two get fired for slacking off on the job, which they don't take well, so we can probably count on them being victims later. But forget about that. Alice needs to get a visit from a county sheriff so we can tell her about the house. Wait a second, county sheriff? Is this movie supposed to take place in the U.S.? You have a lot to say about what I should be doing. I think this house needs a total cleaning. Guys, you want to talk about class? Let's talk about that Jarrett woman. House paints. Very wrong, buddy. <laughs> right, America. Gotcha. So anyway, tell us about the house, Sheriff. This guy bought a bit of land to build a house on. A guy named Ed Verdon. Well, Ed was a carpenter by trade, small time with good. Everyone pretty much agreed that Ed was a nice enough guy. <laughs> Except, uh, had a bit of a temper. A wild temper. Yeah, thanks, Sheriff. I know what a temper is. Is everyone in this town creepy as fuck? Exposition Cop tells Alice that Ed got into debt because he wouldn't stop working on the house and ended up murdering several repo men before getting the electric chair. You hear that? It's the screams of repo man. What was his dead? Man ripped to pieces. Man killed without mercy. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the donuts, ma'am. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to tell people about the pet cemetery down the road. As revenge for getting fired, the two guys from earlier decide to break into the house and steal some tools, and if they're sneaky, maybe they can nab them without getting murdered. 
Jesus, you guys want to be louder? If there's any other dead people in here, you'll wake them up. We have enough. Look, right, there's a brand new sander down there, and I'm gonna get it. You sure are. <laughs> okay, is everyone in this house deaf? Not only did no one hear these two breaking in, they also apparently don't notice the power tool murder. Then again, considering how Alice reacts to this, maybe they just don't give a shit. Do you really think that's necessary? Oh, I don't like to leave things half done. It's a bit messy, don't you think? There's a dead guy in front of you! Don't you care? Yeah, that's the trouble these days. People do not take the time to do something right. Well, people have different things on their minds. Like what? Ignoring murder? But maybe I'm just not seeing Ed's folksy, undead southern charm. I mean, Ed, take a look at this guy. Watch this, see? You see what I mean? He's soft. Why, in my day, you could go through ten drill bits before you even reached a man's rib cage. Nice to know the foreman's still working on the house despite several of his workers going missing. But Alice's husband has other things to worry about. You cannot call me here. Well, God knows I've already made enough concessions for you. You cannot call me here at any time. I've got a wife. Don't you think she wonders? I don't know. She doesn't seem to mind people getting violently murdered right in front of her. Maybe she doesn't care that you're cheating on her. Ooh, a hotel with heart-shaped pillows? This guy is a romantic. No, this is serious, Martin. Well, not too serious, I hope. I'm feeling a bit of the piss and vinegar right now. Ugh, I never wanted to know this guy was into water sports. But first, she's got something important to tell him. I'm pregnant, Martin. That's okay. According to Fox News, not only are abortions covered by our health care, they're also mandatory. Alice's sister drops by for a visit. I wonder what they're going to talk about. Do you remember that guy? Nelson something. Oh, no, the guy no, that used no. to take his pants down near the this school? Guy. Do you remember the day that he came with a guard dog <laughs> around his neck? neck? And he was running around telling everyone who's going to hang himself. And everyone said, please, Nelson, please do it. Put yourself out of your misery. Okay, so even when she was a kid, Alice wanted to see people die in front of her. I guess that explains her attraction to Ed, who's gone from being a carpenter to Colonel Sanders? The music's lovely. Wow. Well, nowhere near as lovely as you are. Hmm, Ed seems kind of nervous. Sure hope he doesn't suffer from premature ectoplasm. And speaking of ghost jizz... Uh, Alice, you know what? <laughs> There's always this. <laughs> Aha! So I was right! That was a money shot earlier! Oops, my mistake. It was just a dream. Next, she's gonna dream about Tetsuo the Iron Man. Now that Alice's sister is here, it means they can talk about boys they like. See, there's somebody else. There is? He comes to see me at night, and he works, and we talk, and he, he does things around the house. And... Yeah, if by does things you mean kills people. I don't know, he makes me feel good. I'll say, one of the attachments for his dick is a vibrator. Oh look, the bloodiest scene in the movie and it's actually red paint. The woman Alice's husband is cheating on her with drops by to tell Alice about the affair. I wonder how she'll take the news. Do you think I don't know that Martin screws the hell out of little kindergarten girls like you? I know. You want to hear something even funnier? I don't really care. Yeah, we know you don't care. You know, it's a little hard to identify with Alice as a character when she has all the empathy of Jeffrey fucking Dahmer. Oh, and did I mention that this movie takes place in America? But for you to come into my house and to drag your dirty little filth into my clean house, now that I care about. I'll tell you what I care about. You come into my house, sit on my couch, well you can just get out. She goes to leave, but joke's on her, she's about to get nailed for the second time today. Oh shit. What is this? It's your girlfriend. Okay, here's the thing about this movie. Alice's husband is supposedly the bad guy because he's cheating on her, but it's hard to sympathize with Alice when she not only tolerates murder, but also actively participates in it. You could maybe argue the first guy deserved what he got since he tried to rape Alice, but these two are just trying to steal some power tools, and this woman just had an affair with her husband and was also pregnant. They didn't deserve to die. Is Alice going for Ed supposed to be the better choice here? Okay, don't get me wrong, Alice's husband is a philandering asshole, but I think that's a little bit better than being a psychotic mass murderer. You're fucking nuts. I've heard that before. You've heard it before because it's true, you psycho! Kinda hard to fuck her now. 
hard, but not impossible. And Ed doesn't appreciate violence in this house that isn't coming from him. Okay, here's another thing. The murder scenes in this movie are actually kind of subdued. I mean, sure, the acts themselves are horrific, he's killing people with power tools, but the way they're presented on screen is actually pretty low-key. There isn't any intense music, it doesn't linger on the gore very long, the camera work's kinda bland, they're almost treated like mundane occurrences. Look, there isn't even any blood when he stabs this guy's hands. If this was an Evil Dead movie, there'd be blood gushing all over the place. <sighs> Damn it, Canada, even our slasher movies are too polite. All you know is how to use your head? Oh, my husband's getting murdered. Oh, this is so dreadfully boring. I think I'll take a shower. Alice's sister comes by and manages to have an actual human reaction to dead bodies lying around. Maybe she can talk some sense into her. What the hell happened? What oh? Happened? No, no, no. There doesn't have to be no trouble. Unless, of course, uh, somebody was make trouble, right? Who in the fuck are you? Well, I'm just a carpenter. Title drop. Oh. Wait, he said a carpenter, not the carpenter. Uh, never mind, forget I said anything. Ed crosses a line when he hits Alice's sister, which finally gets a reaction out of her. Get away from us, you're an asshole! He's a murderer! Get away from him! Alice figures out a way to hurt Ed, and that's by ruining all his hard work. And if that doesn't work, just hit him with a hammer. This is a tool, not a toy. Nobody kills people with tools in this house but me, little lady. But maybe it's not too late for these two to patch things up. Don't you think it's time you gave out? You make me sick. You're filthy, and you're dead, and you smell bad. And he's a murderer! Why the hell do you not care about that part? We learn that whenever the house gets damaged, so does Ed, because... Um... Ghost science, I guess? Good thing Alice's sister's there to lend a hand. Ah, property destruction! My one weakness! Alice! Alice! Ah! Well, congratulations, Alice. Not only did you get rid of the ghost, but if you have insurance, you might be able to get some money out of this whole situation, too. But some ghosts just can't take a hint. Should have been more of a gentleman, Ed. Yes, you should have been more of a gentleman. And, you know, not a psycho ghost carpenter. The Carpenter seems like an attempt to do a more artsy, low-key horror movie than your average 1980s slasher film. And while it's admirable that it tried to do something a little different, I'm not sure that that was the best approach. I mean, come on, it's about a ghost killing people with power tools. Fuck being low-key, just go for it. One thing that does make the movie worth watching is Wings Hauser's performance. He's like Billy Zane, he was practically born to play guys who are charming and creepy at the same time. It's a decent movie, but much like the country it was made in, it's a little too polite. Well, that's it for part two, but stay tuned for part three to see the return of another veteran of this show. Until next time... Hello and welcome to part three of my Canucksploitation a thon. We're taking a bit of a step back for today's movie since unlike the last one I did, this one isn't available on DVD. Well, okay, you can get a DVD-R of the movie on Amazon for the bargain price of only 150 bucks. Wow, doesn't this DVD transfer look worth the money? Actually, one place it is available on DVD is as a clip in the 50 Worst Movies Ever Made compilation. Ah, oh boy. Is there anything in this movie worth my time? Now listen, I want you to put one in this burner's block. I gotta get a fix on that gas jockey. Holy shit. He's back! <laughs> alright, alright, I don't want the sound muted on this video, so I can't play the whole intro. Still, it is nice to see that this Canadian movie has a real American like Doug McClure in it. Oh, right, the movie. Firebird 2015 AD is a 1981... Um, I guess sci-fi film? There really isn't anything futuristic in it, and it technically takes place in the past now, so does that make it some kind of weird period drama? The premise of the movie is... Actually, you know what? Why don't I just let the movie's theme song explain? It was a black day in August 1992 When Congress said, hey buddy, no more oil for you 
is enough for our leaders in the military force. So, buddy, don't complain. Just get out and get a horse. Oh, yeah, I remember 1992. A loudmouth billionaire was running against a Clinton for the White House. Theaters were full of sequels. And the president of Brazil got impeached. Ah, uh, my, how times change. So due to an oil shortage, the U.S. government outlaws private car use, but a small group of people called burners still drive cars as the ultimate form of rebellion. It's sort of like Mad Max, only without all the awesome stunts and crazy characters. What's even weirder is, according to the song, the government did this for seemingly no reason. Wait, so if there's still lots of oil, then why did the government outlaw cars? Did they do this just to fuck with people? Anyway, Darren McGavin plays a burner called Red, and you can tell it's the future because his jacket's all silver and shiny. Red's helping another burner transport a senator who wants to make cars legal again, but he can't pick him up himself since he's too busy working on his own car. If you listen very carefully during this part, you can actually hear all the gearheads in the audience getting a boner. Red's son, Cameron, sneaks in to take a look at the Firebird, but something tells me Red doesn't want him there. I figured it was you. Yeah, I don't blame Red. Last time his son tried to help him with the car, this happened. There we go. Damn! Oh! Fudge. Also, is Red creating Frankenstein in there? Why is he dressed like that? Cameron's a little estranged from his father, mainly because he was more interested in working on his car than raising his son. Yeah, well, you're still breaking the law. And you're wasting limited resources. Limited resources? If I had to, I could make fuel out of bullshit. Eh, why not? They make movie scripts out of it. It's better than getting busted as a burner. A burner! That's right, I am a burner. I burn illegal hot fuel. I'm sure there's a pot joke in there somewhere, but I'm too lazy to think of one right now. But time for Red to explain to his son the philosophy of the entire movie. I burn illegal hot fuel. And you know why? Because... That's right. Even the movie isn't sure what point it's trying to make. To show his son why he still drives a car, Red decides to take Cameron for a spin. He still puts on a helmet, though. They may be breaking the law, but safety first. This is like if Batman and Robin were played by the Dukes of Hazard. Oh, and if you're wondering what Doug's role in the story is, he's a sheriff of the Department of Vehicle Control, or DVC, whose job is to stop burners, with deadly force if necessary. They're kind of like the DMV, but a little more pleasant to deal with. Uh, let's go bust a burner. Where's Dolan? Up in the hills playing Indian, probably. Really? Because to me it looks like he's reenacting the beginning to The Lion King. I'm not sure if this guy's meditating or having a transcendental orgasm. Anyway, the DVC spots the guy going to pick up the senator and chases after him. You know what? I take it back. Instead of Mad Max, this is reminding me more of Death Sport. Good thing the DVC are pros at what they do. I had you right where I wanted you. <laughs> I'm your boss and you just shot at me. Say goodbye to your Christmas bonus. Now listen, I want you to put one in this burner's block. I can't miss. Yeah. Pretend it's me. But she missed you. And I think you guys might be overreacting a bit. The guy's only driving a car illegally. Just shoot out his tires and tell him to walk home. The burner runs into fake Ahantas here, and if a bit of garbage was able to make this Indian cry, how's this guy gonna react to this gas guzzler? Holy shit! Well, that's one way to cut down on fossil fuel usage, I guess. That's for not buying a Prius, motherfucker. Well, he's dead. How's Cameron's driving lesson going? Oh, uh, you hated it, right? Hate what? What? The, the, the feeling, the... the, the... No, I don't hate it. I mean, it's not as good as my futuristic sex robot, but it's all right, I guess. What is it? It's another burner got burned. Aren't you worried? Me, no. Really? Because you fucking should be. Although, I am a little confused about the DVC's regulations. 
How are you going to explain two dead burners in two weeks? What are you mad at him for? You were the one shooting at him earlier. And if you're not supposed to kill people, why the hell are you equipped with assault rifles and grenade launchers in the first place? Anyway, Red meets up with another burner called Indy, who also has a midlife crisis mobile. Who's he? It's Cameron. Mm -hmm. Who's that? Hey, my son. Huh, you never mentioned you had a son before. I guess you really are a deadbeat. And it looks like there's another new burner in town. Good girl. Oh, no shit. When did that happen? My god, women able to drive vehicles? Has the whole world gone mad? This is Indy's daughter, Jill, and let me guess. Her and Cameron hook up? Okay, just checking. Time to see the sparks fly between these two. Now you see this here? Well, when I tell you, kind of move it up and down. You think you can handle that? Okay, but I can only do it for about 30 seconds. Oh, and the car innuendos do not end there. Okay, now put a little ass in it, rookie. Ah, damn. <laughs> Did you find the tailpipe? Ooh, she's a keeper. Not a lot of women will let you find the tailpipe on the first date. But there's something more important than their budding romance, and that's Red and Indy getting into a pissing contest over whose car is better. Oh, come on, let's make it worthwhile. Uh, the championship of all of Silver Mine County, and 50 gallons of gas. Ooh. Done. Yeah, screw conserving a limited resource for the good of society. I want to do some fucking donuts. This fire Okay, if it seems like hardly anything's happened in the movie so far, that's because it's true. Several minutes of the movie are devoted to people just randomly driving around. There's no awesome stunts, no action sequences, it's just people driving. Look, I get that driving can be a lot of fun, but when all you're doing is watching other people on screen drive with nothing really at stake, it's kind of boring. Maybe Cameron's driving lesson is more interesting. This is the gear shift. Throwing more girls than picket fences. Jill lost her virginity to that dune buggy, didn't she? Okay, step on the clutch. No, 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 now push it in and hold it. But slip it in. Nice and easy. Ever wanted to relive driver's ed, but with your teacher aggressively hitting on you? This is first, down to second, up to third, and down to fourth. First, second... Third. Fourth. Ooh, that's nice. Ooh. Okay, I get it. You're using driving as a metaphor for fucking. Cameron proves to be a bad student and crashes the buggy, but maybe this will give these two time to get to know each other better. What do you do when you're not driving around scaring the piss out of people? I'm a silicone chip engineer. A what? I put together calculators. Ah, yes. By 2015, calculators were so advanced they could display up to seven digits. Well, at least there's no more driving sexual innuendos. Second time's always better than the first. Ugh. And Jesus Christ, you mean these two are still racing? Please tell me there's some people with guns nearby. Just take it easy. Don't take it easy. I've been watching them drive for over ten minutes. Start shooting. I may be risking my life, but it's totally worth it not to have to take public transportation! I don't know if this affects their bet, but Jill and Cameron are busy making a deal of their own. Well, I'll take you out for a ride, if you show me Red's stash. She means his other stash. There's a reason he's called a burner, after all. Hey, I found that pot joke I was talking about earlier. Red is not gonna like this. Have you seen anything of Jilly? I'm getting worried. What'd she do with my son? Take him home with her. Who the hell no? Who the hell knows? Who the hell knows? Okay, I don't know who convinced Darren McGavin to be in this movie, but God bless him because he's one of those actors who manages to be watchable no matter what he's in. I just wish he was trying to track down a vampire instead of driving around aimlessly. And did the government also outlaw nudity in the future? Jeez, I know this movie's rated PG, but you could be a little more sly about the fact that she's fully clothed here. Not to mention, we're over halfway through and Doug's hardly been in this movie. They keep talking about Crazy Horse here. What are we gonna do, Jason? About what? Dolan. Dolan's okay, I'll look after him. How many drivers do we let him scratch? Two, ten, twenty? Go take another shower. 
I didn't fight an army of rubber dinosaurs to take this shit from you. And again, if they're not supposed to kill burners, why the hell do they have all this military hardware? Are they supposed to use that grenade launcher to hand out tickets? Cameron shows Jill his dad's garage, which does not go over well with Red. How'd you get in here? I was dropped off. By you, did you, you let, you, you let... Congratulations, Cameron, you just gave your dad a stroke. But now Jill and Red can tell Cameron just why they're burners. A law that does not reflect the will of the people cannot be morally enforced. Those that enforce unjust laws are in themselves, by their very acts, unjust. Okay, here's my problem with the premise of this movie. If Red's right and there's still plenty of oil around, then why the hell would the government bring productivity to a screeching halt by outlawing the most common form of transportation? And if he's wrong and there really is an oil shortage, then he probably shouldn't be wasting a scarce resource going joyriding in his fucking sports car! No wonder the DVC's trying to nail his ass. Although Doug doesn't seem to be happy with their methods. Firebird! I saw the Firebird! I never saw two together like that before. My whole inside shook! Well, how'd they get away? Because he was too anxious. He fired a round off about a thousand yards. He blew it. You fired at that distance? What the hell's the matter with you? They were just driving around for several minutes. I was bored as shit! And if they're upset with Dolan killing people, maybe they should take his grenade launcher away. It's gotta be pretty tough to shoot to wound with one of those. But Cameron still has some questions for his dad. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Is the car the reason you and Mom split up? Actually, it is. She walked in on him after he found the tailpipe. Red gets a message that the senator was never picked up, which surprises him, probably because he forgot that was even a plot line in this movie. Oh well, are Jill and Cameron up to anything interesting? I was blind before I met you. Okay, the point is, these two are in love, and they decide to consummate it by having a literal roll in the hay. It's smooth. It's sexy. <laughs> Here's hoping their dirty talk isn't just them reading auto trader listings to each other. Cam! Oh, Jesus! I gotta say, I was not expecting Jill to be a squirter. And hey look, PG boobies! Wait a second, if they're able to show that, then how come Policey McLady Mullet had to shower with her clothes on? Unfortunately, they're interrupted when some DVC thugs break in. I guess the C must stand for cock blockers. Also, the DVC's mad at Dolan for killing people, yet no one seems to care that the other officers have a serious rapey vibe. When did this movie turn into the beginning of I Spit on Your Grave? <laughs> Well, that was at least a 15-foot fall, so I guess he must be dead. Jill gets taken to see Doug, and after getting assaulted and having her boyfriend seemingly killed in front of her, I'm sure she'll be happy to cooperate. All you have to do is tell me where the fire burned it. That's all you have to do. <laughs> right now, Doug's thinking, how the hell did I go from making out with Caroline Monroe to this? And is Jason Voorhees in this movie? Oh, it's just Cameron. I guess that second story fall didn't kill him after all. So what do we do now? We go get Jill. Yeah, and you better hurry. I don't think she's safe here. <laughs> Jesus, now Dolan's getting rapey? The DVC seriously needs to rethink its vetting process. <laughs> That's it, Dolan. You keep on murdering and raping people, and I'm gonna be forced to dock your pay by 5%, pal! Red and Indy modify the Firebird to rescue Jill, which means we're finally gonna get an action sequence in this movie. Unfortunately, it looks like they had the same cinematographer as Blue Monkey. Time for Darren McGavin to show why he's the finest action star of his generation. And time for Doug McClure to pretend he's shooting at rubber dinosaurs again. He's trying to inject some excitement into this movie, don't stop him! The modifications to the Firebirds seem to consist of adding a lighting rig to the front, which apparently also made it completely bulletproof. But whatever works, I guess. Done! Oh no, not the psycho murderer rapist! Ugh. Good night, sweet prince. All things considered, this is a decent action sequence, which makes me wish they didn't wait until the last 10 minutes of the movie to have one. Oh, and I guess the lady DVC officer's on their side now? Uh, considering what her co-workers are like, I don't blame her. And so the Burners rescue Jill. 
I think. I can't really see. And wasn't there a senator they were supposed to pick up? 20 minutes for the senator, Dad. Oh yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Even Darren McGavin forgot that was a thing in this movie. The important thing is, they get to keep using a non-renewable resource, which may or may not be in short supply. Plus, I think Red's about to get lucky. Did have a shower? Oh, yeah! Hot water? Uh-huh. Yeah, I've also got a uh, sauna. You do? Ah, looks like somebody's gonna find the tailpipe tonight. So remember in my review of The Carpenter where I said it was too low-key and should have been more of a crazy exploitation film? Well, that goes double for this movie. The premise of a world where oil is scarce and driving is outlawed has some promise, even if the reasons they give in the movie don't make a whole lot of sense, which is why it's disappointing that so much of its runtime is spent just trying to show that driving is fun. That may be true in real life, but when there's barely any stunts or conflict, on film it's pretty dull. It's partly saved by Darren McGavin and Doug McClure, two actors that could play the roles they're given in their sleep. But if they weren't in this movie, I would have checked out long before I got to the end. So that's the end of part three. There's only one more movie in the Canuxploitation-a-thon to go, and believe me when I say, I've saved the, um, best for last. Until next time. Ooh, that's nice. Ooh. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Hello and welcome to the fourth and final part of my Canuxploitation-a-thon. Because this is the last one, I got a real special movie for you. And when I say special, I mean it in that Ralph Wiggum kind of way. The Shape of Things to Come is a 1979 adaptation of the sci-fi novel by H.G. Wells. And when I say it's an adaptation, I mean the filmmakers use the title as an excuse to make a Star Wars knockoff. The novel is kind of a future history book, stretching from the 1930s all the way up to the 22nd century, and ending with mankind achieving a utopia. This movie is about Jack Palance using an army of robots to conquer the moon. And I know what you're thinking, based on that description, this movie sounds awesome, but the reality is a lot different. Well, it's the beginning of a sci-fi movie, which means we got a whole lot of text to read. Wait, the time is the tomorrow after tomorrow? So it's the day after tomorrow. That's always a good sign. Alright, the gist of the movie is that Earth has been devastated by war, forcing most of humanity to colonize the moon. However, because of high levels of radiation, mankind depends on a drug called Radic Q2, which is only produced on a desolate planet called Delta-3. So, in other words... He who controls the spice controls the universe! Also, I don't know how to tell you this, but I think your credits are on fire. Ah, oh, jeez, I can't believe this. This intro is such a rip-off of the opening to Star Crash. This is Washington. New Washington. You sure? Because it looks a lot like Epcot to me. I see this movie has a Space 1999 cast member in it, so at least we know the moon got back into orbit. And what? Clea from the Doctor Strange movie is in this too? Oh, poor girl. First her pilot doesn't get picked up as a series, and now she has to star in this. Barry Morse plays Dr. Cabell, creator of an experimental spaceship called the Star Streak, but a senator on the Moon Council won't let him test it because of orders from New Washington's master computer. Is it me, or did that sound like the plot to a parody of a sci-fi movie? Unfortunately, a ship piloted by some rejected Doctor Who robots is on a collision course with New Washington. Yellow alert. The whole city's on yellow alert. Well, better evacuate the city. At the speed this thing's going, it'll crash within the next week. Their Commodore VIC-20s don't seem to be much help. Hopefully the city's master computer knows what to do. Master computer Lomax, this is Jason Cabell. ID confirmed. Go ahead, Jason. Eh, you know what? The voice of this thing is reminding me of another Canadian movie. Do not try to escape. You are in my control. I am the sum of all evil. The computer's unable to stop the ship, and what's worse, they still haven't evacuated Zardoz yet. Just kidding. I wish I wasn't, though. There's still 90 minutes left. But hey, look on the bright side. At least the guy who crashed into you remembered to leave a note. This is almost... Robot Master on Delta 3. Ah, I see this is the forgotten Battlestar Galactica sequel, The Legend of Curly's Gold. 
Omus is played by Jack Palance, who I assume had a new car he needed to pay off. Omus explains that he's overthrown the government of Delta III and plans to use his robots to take over the moon, the Earth, the galaxy, you know the drill. What is it you want? I have made giant strides in technology, Senator. Oh yeah? Then explain those robots. New Washington is not gonna stand for this. Lomax, what is your opinion? From data stored in computer baffles, it would seem that an act of aggression on our part would be imprudent. Exactly. Wait, what? Lomax, you authorized the building of Star Streak. For exploration and defensive purposes only. The guy crashed a ship into your city and said he wants to take over everything. I think stopping him counts as defending yourself. And the supercomputer isn't the only thing that doesn't make sense in this movie. For example, are those spacesuits or are they cosplaying as baked potatoes? And are you sure this isn't actually New Ottawa? We found the pilot. It's wedged in here. May take a while to get it out. Oh yeah, bud, like that thing's wedged right the fuck in there, eh? They take the wreckage of the robot pilot that crashed into the city and give it an emergency R2-D2-ectomy. I don't know what they called you on Delta III, but I'm gonna call you Sparks. I, I, I am, I am, You're working. I am, I am. Oh, did I say R2-D2? I meant those cutesy robots from the black hole. Looks like it's time for the script to not make sense again. Omus wants to control all of our lives. Just the same way he controls his robots. He sees himself as some kind of benevolent dictator. Our society has no place for a dictator. Uh, you take all your orders from a supercomputer. Doesn't that technically count as a dictator of some sort? Or did that thing get voted in? Cabal decides to defy the supercomputer and take the star streak, cause hey, he didn't vote for him. Oh, and he gets radiation poisoning starting it up or something? Seems like it'd be a lot easier to just use an ignition key. Meanwhile, Sparks demonstrates his ability to be precious. Watch this. How was that? Wow, you can do stupid things, Sparks. Since one guy isn't enough crew for the star streak, Kim and Cabal's son Jason decide to go with. I would like to help. No, don't take the robot. Eh, well, I guess it could be worse. At least he doesn't have robo testicles. I've located Dr. Cabal. Visual scanners on star streak activated. Preparing for takeoff. Lomax, you've got to stop them. They are seriously endangering our plan to do nothing. But surprise, the supercomputer doesn't do anything and lets them leave. Out there is the vastness of space. Where all possibilities exist, man's future is limited only by his imagination. Well, and budget in this case. Meanwhile, on Delta III, the former leader, Governor Nikki, yes, that is the name they're going with here, is busy organizing a resistance group against Omis, which consists of about eight people with spears. I'm starting to understand how Omis was able to take over this planet so easily. They might want to postpone their attack on Omis. Their lightsabers look a little short. Seriously though, are there no guns in the future? It looks like they got all their weapons from a Frank Frazetta painting. My god, Omis' plan is to take over Delta III's water treatment plant, the Fiend! And take note everyone, when constructing an army of robots to take over the galaxy, make them as slow and clunky as possible. Hopefully Nikki can call for help. Calling New Washington. This is the Delta III Citadel, Nikki calling. We need some assistance! We need some assistance! Like, OMG, we totally need help. These robots are so grody. Turns out sneaking right into Omus' office was a bad idea, and Nikki gets discovered by his robots. Well, looks like they're trapped, and oh, never mind, you can just run past them. The Resistance members' weapons prove to be no match for the robot's highly advanced bitch slap technology. I tell them to run away, but you could probably power walk faster than these things. Meanwhile, we learn the Star Streak is malfunctioning, and they decide to stop on Earth to repair it. It's gonna be strange being back on the Earth again. Seven years since the last of the great robot wars, and the end of civilization as we had known it. Ah, come on, Robot Wars wasn't that bad. Whenever your spaceship needs repairs, always be sure to stop at the nearest pirate radio station. Unfortunately, the only one there is an extra from an Italian zombie movie. Oh, and some more Doctor Who monsters that apparently kidnap Kim. Hey, uh, I got a question. If Earth was largely abandoned due to high radiation levels, shouldn't they be wearing protection right now? I can't get an exact reading. 
but I'm picking up a high radiation level in this area. Jeez, better turn back and get some radiation suits, or just keep going, whatever. I have no idea what these grass monsters are, but here's what I hope they do to Sparks. <laughs> But it turns out these weird monsters are actually something even more terrifying. They're children. Oh god, it's an entire planet of Kennys! Okay, these kids aren't actually Kennys, mainly because they don't talk and aren't in the movie very long. But they do illustrate another problem with this whole situation. Jason, they're sick. Radiation. Yeah, radiation, which is why you should be getting the hell out of there! Actually, they do end up leaving after promising to bring back some Radic Q2 for the kids, so I guess they didn't need those repairs they were talking about earlier. Hopefully going the speed of light will make this movie go quicker. Feel anything? We're approaching the speed of light. Well, I'll just be glad the Force Shield is fully operative. Yeah, the Force is not with this movie. Also, bullshit you're going the speed of light. Does anything on this ship work? No deviation from set flight path, 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 path. Okay, take it easy, Sparks. I'll reprogram a better self-adjusting tape for you when we get back to the moon. How about you just leave him turned off? That way we wouldn't have to hear dialogue like this. Yeah, well, I guess we could all use something to eat, huh? Sure. Nothing for me, thanks. Ha <laughs> ha! Sparks can't eat anything because he's a robot. Not that Omus's robots are much better. I feel like fat guy tuba music should be playing whenever they're on screen. Fortunately for the Resistance, the robot sensors can't detect anything through tall grass. You know, it just occurred to me that we're two-thirds of the way through and our heroes haven't even gotten to Delta Three yet. This is like if most of Star Wars runtime was just the heroes sitting in the Millennium Falcon waiting to get to the Death Star. But this leaves time for more important things like sexual tension. I don't know, Sparks. Sometimes the way you look at me, you give me the feeling that... Forget it. You are just a robot, aren't you? I'm afraid so, but if there is any change, you'll be the first to know. The robot wants to fuck Kim. That is an actual thing in this movie. Something finally decides to happen when the ship accidentally enters the 2001 ending nebula. Closing rapidly on magnetic field. We're gonna break up! Well, at least the nebula comes with a light show. When they get to Plaid, that's how we'll know they've reached ludicrous speed. What the fuck is happening? I can't tell if they're in pain or having the greatest orgasm ever. I could have done without seeing the robot's cum face, though. What the hell was that all about? Eh, they had to kill 10 minutes of runtime somehow. They finally reach Delta 3 and spot another one of Omus' ships. We could try and fire a missile. No, no, we haven't got the maneuverability, Jason. Oh, it needs more destruction than New Washington. And we just have to stand by and do nothing. Right, because God forbid we have a space battle in this movie. And is it me, or does Delta 3 look a lot like where they were on Earth? Hey, you didn't happen to bring a gun, did you? I think that could really tip the odds in our favor. Welcome, friends, but we better get away from here. Too late. Oh no, it took five days, but they finally caught up with us somehow. It's a good thing the Star Street crew is there. That just doubled the Resistance's numbers. I feel like these robots wouldn't be a threat if these people could just fight a little better than the Star Wars kid. Just when the situation looks hopeless, the movie somehow finds a way to make Jack Palance look even sillier. I am almost Emperor of Delta III. By the way, does anyone know how to make my chair stop spinning? I have many impressive things to show you in my citadel. My guard robot will bring you. John, this could be dangerous. Oh no, not danger in a sci-fi adventure. Now that I think of it, what exactly was Cabal's plan? The Star Streak is set up as a powerful ship that could be used to fight Omis, but when they get there, they just land with no weapons and then walk around until they get captured. We also learn Omis plans to steal the Star Streak to return to New Washington, so way to hand it right to him. Hey, so should we help? No? Okay, well, good luck then, I guess. I'm not waiting any longer. I'm going to sit it out. It's not that easy. You know, we've seen Sparks can teleport. You could have him just grab Cabal and get the hell out of there. It's just a suggestion. 
Well, that's it. Now Cabal's really going to politely ask Omus not to take over the galaxy. Dr. Cabal. I was waiting with my chair turned for this moment. I'll bet Jack Palance craps bigger than this guy. Omus explains his plan to Cabal, who remains unimpressed. Under my rule, the people will want for nothing. Except freedom. Again, your society is run by a computer. At least with Omus in charge, your dictator will be an Academy Award winner. When Cabal refuses to help, Omus shows him his newest invention, a helmet that robs Jack Palance of even more of his dignity. And a machine that makes Cabal really, really have to pee. <laughs> Fun fact, that was also his reaction at the movie's premiere. After killing Cabal, Omus contacts the Starstreak. D3R765? This is Omus. Your creator. And just how does Omus know that Sparks is on the ship and is the same robot that crashed into New Washington? At this point, I'm not even mad at this part, since it's actually consistent with all the other stuff that doesn't make sense in this movie. Like Cabal saying the moon will never tolerate a dictator even though they take all their orders from a computer, the ship landing on Earth to get repairs and then leaving without getting any, and introducing a plotline about Cabal getting radiation poisoning only to then have him die of something else. But hey, at least we still have the movie's stunning action sequences. <laughs> Damn, the robots found a rock. There's no way the Resistance can stand up to that kind of firepower. You know, I just realized pretty much all of Jack Palance's scenes take place in this one room. Is this filmed in his house or something? Star Street, Martin. To arrive at the Citadel any moment now. What do you want with Star Street? What do you think he wants? Omus explains that he's rigged Delta III to explode by evolving it to death or some shit like that, I don't really know. The point is we get to see Jack Palance wear this funny helmet again. Oh no, why did I chug that Powerade before I came in here? The day is saved, however, when Sparks remotely reprograms all of Omus' robots to turn against him. Sure, why not? That's right, Sparks just became a literal deus ex machina. But this leads to what is easily my favorite part of the movie. After the crew escapes when the planet starts exploding, we get this moment. <laughs> you know, when watching a movie like this, sometimes you just gotta cherish the little things. Like Jack Palance accidentally getting hit on the head by a piece of fake debris. Oh, and there goes the universe's only known source of Radic Q2, so I guess anybody who gets radiation poisoning in the future is fucked. Happy ending! Well, I will say this about the movie, it's given Escape from Galaxy 3 some serious competition for worst movie I've ever done on this show. I featured movies with worse effects, worse acting, and plots that make less sense than this one, but there's something almost magical about the way all those elements come together to create one gigantic pile of shit. The movie's biggest crime isn't that it's cheesy, it's that it's boringly cheesy. It has none of the colorful energy of something like Star Crash. Instead, it's just dull. Oh, and out of all the movies I've done in the Canuxploitation-a-thon, this is the one most easily available on DVD. Ultimately, this movie commits the two worst sins a movie can. It's stupid and boring. And unless you really want to see Jack Palance get hit on the head, I just can't recommend this one. So that's it, the end of the Canuxploitation a thon. And after four of these movies, all I can say is. Oh, Canada. Well, that's all for now. Until next time. <laughs>